Deep Sea Divers, what discovery traumatized you for the rest of your life? I've worked as a police diver for over ten years now, but after my recent horrifying discovery I don't think I'll ever go back to work again. Yesterday morning started like any other dive. I received the orders to perform a body search and recovery yesterday after an elderly woman drowned in the lake. The woman, nearly ninety years old, waded into the water fully dressed until she was up to her neck, then swam past the point where she couldn't reach the bottom, and then she just stopped swimming. The witness present reported that she didn't make any attempt to fight it. She just allowed herself to drown in the broad daylight of late afternoon in completely calm water. An apparent suicide. Nobody helped her. The lieutenant told me to go get her and said that her family wanted her home. This was normal. At least that's what I thought. Until I discovered the horrifying truth of this death. I set out later in the evening, accompanied by only one other member of the team, an older man with silver hair named Henry, apparently an expert in navigating the enormous lake. He had a knack for determining where the water would carry a body. Once we were out on the lake, he said he'd get me to the search area, but that he wouldn't go in. I was a little annoyed by this, but somebody had to get the job done. So I put on my gear and fell backwards into the cold water. Visibility was poor, but I could see well enough with the beam of my headlight, just a few feet in front of me at a time. She'd only drowned earlier that day, so I knew her body would still be resting on the floor of the lake. Not enough gas built up to float yet. I propelled myself down to the bottom to begin my search swimming along the floor systematically to ensure I wasn't just going in circles, the silt suspended in the water obscuring my view. It wasn't long before I found a body, curled into a ball, the back towards me. I swam closer to investigate the sunken corpse, extending one hand to roll it over to face me. Immediately I was startled by the state of the body. The skin blistered and discolored a sickly green, the hands and feet bloated and bleached pale, wrinkled. The eyes were closed, face partially coated in a hardened gray wax. Based on the amount of decay, I severely doubted this was the woman I was looking for. Yet, the clothing matched the description of what she'd been wearing at her time of death. And, when I forced myself to look past the decomposition, she did resemble the picture I'd seen at the station. She even had the exact same necklace on. I didn't know it yet, but something about this body was deeply wrong. I started tugging on my line to signal I'd found the body, or at the very least a body. I unpacked my underwater body bag, flattening it on the lake's floor. I scooped the body up in my arms before gently laying her on the bright yellow material. After zipping it up, I secured the bag to the hook that Henry had lowered from the boat. He'd pull it up from there, so I began to surface, heaving myself onto the boat as soon as I reached the top. I'm not sure if it's the woman we were looking for, I admitted with a shrug after popping my mouthpiece out. I took a few moments to catch my breath. She looks like she's been in there for a while. As the yellow bag emerged from the dark water, Henry grabbed hold of it, steadying it and laying it on the deck between us. I removed my mask and shouldered off my heavy gear. Well, let's give her a look then, he replied, bending down to unzip the bag, exposing the putrefying corpse. Yep, that's her. What the F? I wondered aloud, studying the body, the decay far too advanced for any of this to make sense. How is that even possible? Henry chuckled lightly, his flippant response incredibly unsettling. There's something in the water here, Sid. Realizing I'd likely sooner get a straight answer out of the corpse I'd just retrieved than out of the vague Henry. I decided to table the discussion until we returned to land. We headed back to the boat, and Henry turned the boat on and sped off back to shore. I quickly closed my eyes, hoping to get a small power nap in, but I got the feeling that we should have been getting close to shore a couple minutes later. As I opened my eyes, I was shocked to find that the shore was no longer visible, and had disappeared completely into the inky blackness of the night. Where are we going, Henry? I asked shortly, my patience running thin. Without a word, Henry pressed forward even faster into the middle of the lake, even farther from the dock. Clenching my teeth, I jumped to my feet to stand directly behind the man, who I assumed must have been raving mad. Henry! I shouted, one hand clinging to the back of his captain's seat to maintain my balance. What the hell is going on? The man stopped abruptly, thrusting me forward against the seat. Killing the engine, he whispered to himself, Crap! Henry cut me off firmly with a shh, as he flipped off the dim lamp in the wheelhouse, then all four exterior navigation lights. Sid, get down and shut up he ordered quietly. Get the F down and shut the F up, he repeated sternly. There was a certain seriousness to his tone that led me to follow his instructions. I backed away from the older man to take a seat on the ground. Henry slipped out of his chair cautiously to ease himself down directly across from me, taking such great care not to make a single sound that I suddenly felt we'd entered a life-or-death situation. In the sudden darkness I noticed a single light, not ours, someone else's, spilling through the windshield. I held my breath, wondering who would be out this time of night. Who could possibly provoke such an extreme reaction from Henry? He appeared to be mouthing prayers to himself, his eyes screwed shut as the light drew closer. 
I heard a disturbance in the water nearby, a soft, repeated splash as something swept gently through the lake surface. The light grew dimmer and the sound softer after what was probably only a minute or two, but felt much longer. I reached across the floor to tap Henry on the shoulder. As he opened his eyes, I pointed up at the windshield, silently communicating that whatever he was so terrified of had likely moved on. He exhaled a sigh of relief. Oh, thank God, he muttered, his tone still hushed. You have to go now. I don't want to be here when he comes back around. You can't seriously mean... I began, not even wanting to say the words for fear of sounding insane. Nodding once, he whispered, Sid, you have to take her. I shook my head in disbelief. You're crazy, Henry, I'm not. Listen, Sid, this isn't a body recovery. This is a search and rescue, he declared, eyes locked firmly on mine. This is our job. This is what we do. The firmness with which he spoke convinced me that he was serious and that I wouldn't find myself back on land until I did as he said. Reluctantly, I pushed myself up off of the floor. I recalled the lieutenant warning me that the job might be a little strange at times, but I didn't think he was serious. There was something horribly wrong about this rescue mission. I quickly put my gear back on and plunged into the lake as quietly as possible. The water was much deeper there, but also considerably clearer. I began my descent following the yellow body bag bright like a beacon, or perhaps a lure, downwards until I found the lake's muddy floor once again. As I reached down to detach the hook, my blood ran cold. The body bag began to wriggle. Movement in water is to be expected, though, so I grabbed the hook, just as the bag grabbed me. Not the bag, but whatever was in it. Certainly it couldn't be the corpse. It clutched my forearm from inside the yellow sack, squirming and writhing. I tried to shake it off, but its grasp was inhumanly strong. Panicked, I used my other arm to unzip the bag, revealing the body, now animated with eyes wide open, hard gray wax flaking around their edges. Still clinging to my arm, she stretched her other ghastly white and wrinkled hand to seize my free arm her darkened fingernails digging into my wetsuit. I struggled to escape, but as I pulled back, she came right with me, attached. The bloated woman shook her head vigorously, a large blister on her neck to bursting with the frantic motion, releasing a pale yellow viscous fluid into the water. She lifted a stark white hand to point off into the distance, farther into the depths of the lake. I stared at her as an expression of fear took over my body. As far as I could tell, it was just me and her down there. Yet there was a certain energy to the water that made the lake feel almost crowded, like I was surrounded by unseen beings just outside the glow of my headlight, hiding behind the silt. It was like we weren't alone. As we reached the faint glowing light, the bottom of the lake evened out for miles with, and I struggled to say this despite having seen it myself, a small town constructed on its floor, crumbling brick houses, empty fields and fenced farmland, disintegrating wooden barns, what appeared to be a main street lined with long abandoned businesses, even a bridge off in the distance, all connected by winding country roads, an underwater ghost town. The woman peeled one hand from my neck, pointing to the left. I turned down the road bordered by a row of crumbling brick houses with sunken roofs, moving along the street until she squeezed my arm. I took this as a signal to stop as we arrived at a large plot of land dotted with carved stones, methodically arranged, an abandoned graveyard, long since forgotten condemned to the depths of the lake. Towards the front of the cemetery I noticed a fresh mound of moistened dirt piled beside an empty grave. Carrying the elderly woman in my aching arms I moved towards the pit. The headstone bore the inscription, Harriet Anderson, 1932 to 2023. A lump grew in my throat. I understood then what I had to do. As I gently lowered her decomposing body in the hole, she gazed fondly up at me, nodding in acceptance. Maybe gratitude is a better word. I shoved the pile of mud into the hole to cover her, smoothing the top over carefully, dazed and horrified by what had just happened to me. I began to surface and swim back to the boat. As the lake's surface came into view, the water growing lighter and the pressure surrounding me decreasing, I attempted to come to terms with what had just happened. Don't get me wrong, I've seen some strange things in my line of work, but nothing like that. Henry clambered onto the deck to greet me. How'd it go? His tone was one as if everything that had just happened was normal. Still horrified, I began to shout at Henry. What the F did I see down there? I began to demand. Christ, Sid, you didn't do any research at all, did you? He answered. There's a car waiting for us by the dock. The drive will give us some time to talk. I'll tell you everything I know, but I can't in good conscience promise that it'll make sense. As the catamaran pulled up alongside the dock, I got up to secure it, though I mostly just wanted an excuse to be alone. Hey, Sid? He called as I exited the wheelhouse. I ducked my head back through the door. Yes, Henry? Welcome to the force, son.